I'm shorter than Miles, so hopefully you can still see the screen. You good? Okay. It's nice to see everybody's faces today. It's been a while since we got to visit with everybody. I'm excited to tell you about uh, one of our uh, research and development projects. It's a project that we're doing in partnership with the American Angus Association, the University of Guelph, and CMEX uh, Beef. Um, some of you here have participated in the testing. Some of you, this might be the first time that you're hearing about it. Um, but I think you can all agree, no matter where you come from or what your program is like, that disease resistance is an issue. And if we were able to have a genetic selection tool in Angus for identifying and selecting for high immune response, uh, that would be beneficial to not only us, cow-calf producers, but the whole industry. So uh, the project is called High Immune Response in Canadian Angus. Um, we're going to use BRD as our model disease here. You know that it's the most common and costliest disease in our industry. It uh, creates losses in terms of mortality, morbidity. We know that in the feedlot, um, it's the cause of 75% of uh, the calves that we lose and 50% of, um, of disease that we have. Now, one thing, I'll come back to this uh, as we go along in this discussion, but the pathogens or the bugs, if you will, that cause BRD, they're both viruses and bacteria. And this will become really important in a moment. Um, the other complication is that treatment is constrained because we keep building more and more resistance to the treatment or the therapeutics that are available to us um, to target these, these diseases. So what can we do? Now, I'm one of those kids at, well, I shouldn't say kid anymore. Should I, I shouldn't call myself kid anymore now that I'm done school, should I? But I'm one of those people that goes to the University of Calgary and is constantly saying, we have this challenge and, and everybody's looking for a solution and I passionately believe that genetic selection is a solution that people overlook or underestimate. And, and I think I'm speaking to the choir here when I say genetic selection would be the most beneficial way to address this, this challenge. So can we select for disease resistance? Well, if you were going to do that, you first need a test with which to be able to identify animals that can resist or have better immune systems, right? The University of Guelph developed a, a test just like this. It's called high immune response, and they patented it. And it can be used really well to identify animals that have higher immune response, so better disease resistance. So let's talk about this. The HIR test from University of Guelph has been used in dairy. Actually, CMEX used it in dairy. It's their immunity plus if you, if you do any dairy, um, if you have any exposure to dairy. In a study um, using 100 herds, the group was able to show that animals with high immune resistance or high immune response actually have 50% less incidence of disease compared to the low. So you can all see my screen. Here's animals with low HIR. Here's animals with high HIR. Half the disease resistance. Also in dairy, they showed that animals that had high immune response had increased milk production with better quality of milk and colostrum, less mastitis infection, less requirement for antibiotics, and increased conception rates. Also in dairy, they tested the response to vaccine, commercial vaccines, the high immune response animals actually developed better antibodies, more antibodies when they were vaccinated so that they could protect themselves better against those diseases. So you're getting more efficacy for your vaccine. 
In pigs, the same group showed that high immune response animals have less disease and there was less loss. In fact, in pigs they showed higher average daily gain for high immune response animals. The pigs actually reached market weight, market weight 10 to 12 days sooner if they were high immune response animals. In sheep, they've showed less nematode infection. And in beef cattle, higher average daily gain and higher carcass quality. So I'm telling you in other species, in dairy, we've seen that this works really well, this test works really well. What we need to do is see if we can adapt this test for the Ingus population. If we did adapt this test, so what? Can you use it for genetic selection? Well, estimates of heritability, that tells you how much of that trait, how much difference in that trait you notice, is actually genetic. So can we make genetic progress for this trait? And estimates of heritability in, in in dairy and pigs, ranged from 0 0.25 to 0 0.35. So you're saying, okay, that's 35% of the variation is genetically controlled. Well, if you look at the heritability of the traits that you select for um, routinely now, calving ease, milk, growth, scrotal circumference, it's in that range. So that tells you that immune response good immune response can be selected for. So the objectives of this study was to adapt and validate this HIR test for Canadian Angus and American Angus Association population and use the test to identify high HIR response animals. And then we can incorporate those genetic, those, um, that trait into our genetic evaluations and use genetic selection as a natural approach rather than therapeutics. The benefits are phenomenal. I mean, reduced and lower severity, reduced incidence and lower severity of disease. Like, that's the biggest one. But look at all the other things. Better conception rates, better milk production, less calf loss, less mastitis, less using antibiotics. Like the, the competitive advantage that a tool like this can give to Canadian Angus is phenomenal. So advantages of using the University of Guelph's HIR test. It was developed in Canada, first of all. I love a, a, a solution that's Canadian made at the University of Guelph. It measures both arm of the immune, res of the immune system. So it's Im it gives you a measurement of immune system that can fight both viruses and bacteria. Remember I said BRD, we have a lot of diseases that are caused by viruses and bacteria. So we want a test that actually identifies animals that can protect from both, not just one arm of, of the immune response. So like I said, there's two arms of the immune response. I'm going to tell you about them really quickly. One is antibody mediated. So that's when your body makes B cells or your, your B cells make antibodies and you can fight off things like bacteria, fungi, uh, or fungus, parasites, okay? The other arm of the immune response is cell mediated. It's your body has very attackery cells. <laughs> They're cells that know to go attack cells that are infected by a virus, for example. So we think this test is robust because it's the only test globally that identifies animals that are good at both arms of the immune system. You don't wanna go through all this work to set up a genetic evaluation for a trait that's only half described. You want to describe the full trait that's really important to us. So this test is, it's not only just a Canadian solution, it's a robust test. Globally, it's the best test for immune systems. The protocol is really extensive. 
Members here that have participated in the testing know it's a big commitment on their part. It's a three-day testing protocol. On day zero, we go and collect a blood sample. The blood sample should, we, we test antibodies using that blood sample, the blood sample should be zero, right? On day zero, we haven't done anything yet. We collect it just to make sure of that. We give the animals an intramuscular injection of type two and type one antibodies, and I'll explain what those are. We go back in 14 days, member runs all those cattle back through the chute, we collect another blood sample. We use that blood sample to measure how many antibodies did each animal make to that intramuscular injection. We also lift the tail and measure the tail fold thickness on both sides. On one side, we give the animal a little intradermal booster of type, type one antigen. That's the cell mediated antigen that we're gonna measure. On the other side, we give a, uh, a little saline injection so that both sides received something. One side received saline, saline, no reaction. We shouldn't find one. On day 15, we go back and we measure that intradermal reaction. So we test the antibody <laughs> measurement and we test the cell mediated measurement. So this test is really robust. You see, I've, I've explained there's two arms of the immune system and we're measuring both arms. And so we put the cattle through the chute three times and we measure all this so that we can have both arms of the immune system measured. So that's a, a three-day protocol. And the reason why we do it, or why I'm making such a big deal about it, is because not all animals are great at both things. And what we really want to do is identify the animals that are great at both things. So far, we've measured almost 4,000 animals. We've measured almost, well, almost 3,000 in Canada. Our members have been phenomenal to, to work with. We've measured across um, Alberta, Saskatchewan, and Manitoba. And we have 500 more left to measure in the US this fall. I'll show you what our members got from the results so far. So preliminary results, members got in herd reports that showed them, and this is obviously a fake report, that showed them, and this is obviously a fake report, but this kind of gives you an idea. We were able to tell members, so for antibody-mediated response, this animal was low, this animal was average, this animal was high in your herd compared to your own herd. We gave them the same for cell-mediated response, and then we gave them an overall response and told them which animals. And sometimes I, I have um, been able to go back to the members and say, did that make sense? Oh yeah, I knew that one was going to be poor. He's always sick. So now you can maybe predict that at the end of the, the, the project, that's the goal. Preliminary results show us that the traits are heritable, which means that it's not something you have to measure in all animals, you can have a genetic evaluation for it. You know you can actually select for it. You can make gains by breeding animals that are higher, higher um, immune response to other animals that are higher immune response. So we need to finish phenotyping or testing the animals in the US. All of these animals are also genotyped so that we can go back and we can look at are there genes or markers next to genes that are actually adding immune response. Can we add those markers to the Angus GS test to make our test more accurate? The most exciting part. Do you want to switch them? Okay. Oh, it's okay. It's it's getting hot. Sorry. Um, the most exciting part about this this project, we've done research projects before, right? We've given you tools. This is the first project where 
we actually incorporated something that I think is the most beneficial. We're going to create a tool for you. We're going to validate it first. So there's a validation portion to this project where we're actually going to look at commercial calves, going to look at their health and mor mortality records on um, commercial operations and in the feedlot. And we're going to look at did the calves from high HIR bulls get sick less often? Did they die less often? We're going to quantify that for you so that you know what impact you're going to make. Like I showed you at the beginning, the graphs where we said, hey, there was 50% less disease incidence in dairy calves that are high immune response rather than low immune response. We want to show you that it works in our population too. So there's a, a validation portion to, to the study. Then, after that, we'll be able to add the trait to our genetic evaluations, to our routine genetic evaluations where we get EPDs for those traits. The, the benefits are countless. You know that as genetics go down the production chain, the changes that you make impact the whole industry and it goes all the way down to the consumer. And I think, I mean, Angus is already renowned with quality, but can you believe it if we can say things like, well, we need less antibiotics. We have healthier cattle. I think it's a big advantage for Angus Genetics. So um, I'm happy to answer any questions about the project. I think it's a phenomenal project. I'm really grateful to the Canadian Angus Foundation and Genome Canada, who have, who have sponsored the project um, and funded it, and um, to all of our members who put their cattle through their shoot three times so that we could collect this video Any questions? Yeah. How soon before the test will be available to members? Um, so it's a, a three-year project. Yeah. And um, unfortunately with COVID, we had to have a year extension because we weren't able to get into the, the uh, herds in the US that we still need to test. Yep. So we should have another year um, of development and validation. Yeah. How many herds are you testing? So um, I can go back to it, but we have 500 more head to test in the US. So we tested, um, 36 herds in Canada, um, almost 2,500 animals. Yeah. Dennis. So what I was just so you're saying if you don't have to purchase these cattle that have been tested, it's all through the I'm sorry, Dennis? So you're saying the feedlots that have to purchase these cattle that have been tested, they follow them through the supply chain? For the validation study? Right. Yeah, so for the validation study, what we did, because we don't want to wait for calves to be born, what we did is we have the calves, we tested the, the bulls. Did that answer your question? Okay. We have the calf records from commercial operations and they used Canadian Angus registered bulls. So we so did the feedlots and we get the cattle that are Yeah, cattle. yeah. So we, we followed them with we followed them from the cow calf producer to the feedlots and, and have the feedlot health data from that too. Yeah, because mm -hmm. there's not a lot of incidence of disease on cow-calf um, operations, so you kind of, and you need enough to make a statistical, uh, you know, uh, measurement, right? So we, we added um, health records from feedlot as well. Any other questions? Yes? I'm wondering, is there built into your evaluation part Absolutely, it's always part of the factor. So um, the question was, will there be, um, we'll consider the environment and the condition animals are in when we're measuring their immune response. And the answer is yes, we, we always consider the environment and 
um, factors that are, so when I said, you know, so far our estimates of heritability are 30%. The other 70% is contributed to by the environment. So we always parse out the environment. Yes. Any other questions? I think we have, um, Jeff? Oh, I have lots of questions actually, I'm curious. <laughs> so, is the idea at the end of the day that the producer would run the test just once? Do they have to do it, like, they run the test, how long before they get the answers back? So, um, the phenotyping is, like you saw, the protocol is 14 days, and then we have to take the, the samples back to the lab and measure the antibodies. So right now it's not a commercial routine evaluation, so I can't tell you what the turnaround time will be. Um, but our genetic evaluations actually are a, are a really sophisticated, um, we, we model each trait. So just because an animal hasn't been phenotyped doesn't mean it won't be, we won't be able to predict its genetic potential for HIR testing because we we use a pedigree matrix to, yeah. to make linkage between animals that have been tested and animals that haven't. Dennis? How many men that were actually in the VIVA are So the, the for the validation yeah, study? No, no, those are the ones that have been phenotyped. Yeah. So the the calves in the validation study, I don't know what the total will be. The total of the bulls, so the bulls, the sires of those calves, the aim is 1,500. Yeah. So Carmen has planned a break so that you can all stretch your legs, visit. You haven't seen each other in a long time. We haven't had a convention. We're going to come back and we're going to listen to a presentation from Jonathan Roca from One Cup AI on the cameras um, and the phenomenal things these cameras can help us capture. And then I'll come back and tell you a little bit more about some other projects that we've been working on.